So this talk started, it was like, hey, how about a basic intro to Tornado, that's what we're talking about on the mailing list, and very quickly it became just a giant package of my opinions. So hopefully you guys are all cool with that. Uh, before I start though, how many of you guys uh, test drive at work? Like you, used, like you, you write tests first. Well, I'm, I'm going to talk about what test driving is, but how many of you ascribe to being test drivers? Right. Right. A few. Okay. Um, so, just a little about me. I work at U Studio, the company that's sponsoring tonight. Um, we do video distribution. Uh, we, we try to make it simple. It's a platform as a service. Uh, it's also API driven, which is kind of um, what motivates this talk. Uh, so everything we we put into the product, we put into our API first. So our front end is just one of our clients of our API. That tends to be what drives our, um, our product suit and the features that kind of stuff. And like everybody else, we are hiring. So if you're looking for an opportunity to work on some fun APIs and work with video, I'm talking. Um, so I'm going to start out by kind of going through, like that title has a lot of terms in it. So if you already know some of these terms, I apologize. I'm just going to kind of roll through it. Um, Test driven is a lot of people think it's it's a waste of time or whatever something that developers do when they don't feel confident you know writing code. But in reality, um, it's it's a process. That's all it is. It's a process of defining your interfaces first in tests, uh, defining your contracts and all that, and then writing the implementation and writing a minimal implementation. That's an important aspect of it. So test driven is write a test. Well. Red green refactor is um, it's a real simple way to remember the process of test driving. So uh, red is you write a test, you write your first test, whatever it should be failing. It's very important that your first test fails. Um, you write until it fails, and then you make that test pass with again the minimal amount of code. We'll go through. We'll actually go through this process in a minute. And then the next thing you do is refactor, and you rewrite your test to expand on the new features you want or to fix bugs or whatever. And this, this last, these last two cycles, you're going to bounce back and forth forever. As long as you have your product, you are going to continually move through that process. Um, new features, obviously, you're right. Brand test. Um, to cover some of the common test-driven myths, um, first one, and, and it's the one of the biggest ones, it's, the, it's one of the ones that keeps a lot of organizations from doing test-driven, is there's a feeling from either management or from the individual developers that it just takes more time to do test driven. And there, there is some truth to that argument. In the first time you set out, well, especially when you first start doing test driven, it will take you a lot longer um, because it will it will mess with the way you're used to writing code. You're used to writing code, getting into a body of it, getting fully in the context, and just writing out what needs to be done. And then maybe you do click testing, maybe you just push it and let somebody, let your QA department test it. But you know, you're, you're within that context, and so you'll add features while you're in there, or you'll just refactor on the fly. Um, so the, when you first start doing test-driven, you will spend more time, but I think that's mostly because you're stepping back and you're, it's actually enforcing you, uh, especially in the web design world, or the web um, developer world, it's, it makes you step back and analyze why you're building things out the way you are. We've got MVC, and a lot of the MVC frameworks, they give you big blank areas to fill in. Right. Here's your here's your Django view. Um, go fill in these buckets, and now you have functionality. And so those things at first it's really great and it's really fast. And then over time it starts getting really long, and you got spaghetti code everywhere. And test driven helps you can help you um, abstract that out because you're going to start doing smaller and smaller testable chunks. Um, and, oh yeah, and, and obviously the most important part is if you go for full coverage or as close to full coverage as you can. When you need to step back and clean up everything, you can change massive amounts of code, internal code, and all your contracts, as long as you're still meeting those, your tests will pass and you can feel confident that that refactoring did not blow up the whole system. Um, which if you've done that before, it can get really hairy. Um, some people say they'll write test layers. No, you don't have the time in the first place. And second of all, if you've ever tried to get full coverage on a, 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 a Bit of a big chunk of code that has not been test driven, um, or at least not fully covered with tests already, it's a, it's a pain, right? You're you're kind of poking at things on the outside, and hopefully you're going to cover everything. And I'll get all my request handlers, and maybe I'll get a few unit tests in there, but for the most part, it's 
it's, it's a lot harder and takes a ton more time to do it afterwards. Um, there's also the very accurate point that you can't test everything. There's no way you're going to be able to test every piece of functionality, especially the people who, who feel the need to test um, every single attribute and private variables and all that. They just they, they go hog wild. All you need to do is test public interfaces. Um, and, and this there's, there's a series of tests, if, if you're not familiar with term, there's the unit test testing single um, small units of code, single functions, single methods. Um, you're not talking out to network services or your database layer or whatever. You're mocking and stubbing and, and all the different terminology that comes along with um, testing. And then you can go into integration tests, which actually talk to databases, talk to external network services. And then you have system tests, right? That those are where, you, let's say you have an API and a front end, you might run Selenium that talks to, Selenium on your browser interface for your web app that talks to your API, that talks to Twitter or to whatever else. That's the, that's the biggest ones. So um, you want to test all of those public interfaces, but you don't care about the minutia. Uh, and, you, and you don't need to freak out about that. Um, that's what you need and no more. Um, and on the flip side, right, like I'm not talking really po positively about test driven, but it won't force all of your code to be well written. Right? It just forces you to think about it or it forces you to write hacky tests, right? You can just as easily go into it and, and stub out some really awful tests or test it, just test themselves. That's one of the things you'll see frequently, like asserting two strings equal each other because you just set an attribute, well, all you're doing is testing that body of that test and, and maybe, yes, I have an object here. Um, otherwise, um, you know, that's, that's not great. So it does enable you to focus in on it, and as soon as you start diving into um, outside-in testing where you test your request handler and then you notice, hey, I need an object in here, and then you unit test that object, and then you continue to drill down, it does allow you to focus on minimal um, implementations on small interfaces, small contracts, um, all that. Um, yeah, does not enforce you to employ design patterns or anything like that. <coughs> so, all right, so that's test driven. So the next buzzword in my um, presentation title is uh, REST APIs. How many of you guys write West REST APIs? Okay, a lot of you. Okay, so I'm gonna be kind of opinionated here, and uh, if your API violates my opinions, Disregard. Um, this is what I see a lot. Um, <laughs> you see, like Flickr's REST API. They have REST in the URL. That's about the last thing that's REST about it. Um, and I'm gonna, to that point, uh, it's a lot easier for me to show you an example, like just a stubbed out example of a REST API, than it is for me to go into what all there is. There's a great paper that I forgot the name. It's like what was it, 98, whatever one. When, they first, when, when the REST concept was first introduced, where he talks about why HTTP is a great example of a REST interface. And I, I encourage you to go read that paper. I'm not going to go there. Uh, all right. So this, in, in Josh Marshall's worldview, is, is REST. Um, and it's mostly about where you put your nouns, where you put your verbs, how you perform your actions. So you notice in the URL, we've got a hierarchy of nouns, right? We've got game slash ID of the game slash users. Um, our verb is post, pretty plain. We've got the body of the resource, and then we we use proper response codes, right? 201 means created. That's that's an important one. A lot, of, a lot of times we'll use these post interfaces and return 200 because that's what our web framework does by default or whatever. Response codes, they, they can perform a lot for you on the client side of interpreting what happened on, on the server. So that's an important part. Um, and then you get the resource representation back. Now, already though, you can get into a bit of arguing about host and whether it's restful. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna get into that. Particularly, this is fairly standard, fairly, fairly well used. It, you have a collection of mm -hmm. objects. You post to add a new one to that. That's pretty standard. Um, this is also an example of rest. This is a standard Git. Um, we have our games, our game ID, users, Joe and we get back our representation. Um, the more you ascribe to REST, the more that representation needs to be exactly the same that you use in your put request. Now, I'm not, when, when I do implementations, I'm not quite that controlling that the entire, you have to give me the entire um, contents of the object in a put request, 
um, that you get on the Git request and vice versa, because a lot of times you're not, I'm not going to let you overwrite that. So you can do partial puts in my world. What you do is up to you. But the, the ultimate thing is that you, for individual items, you use put to update individual attributes and kick off actions after that. You notice we have a 200. Um, that's fairly standard, you know, 200 to get. Um, this is not as much rest. So here you notice we have a verb in the post. Um, this, is, this is very commonly done. And it's a pretty easy solution to start sliding to because rest is not always, everything does not always fit perfectly in the rest model. You kind of have to step back and analyze your resources and your actions. And, and I think most things can be put in the rest model, but sometimes people cheat and they just, ah, I can put a verb on the tail end of my collection or on, on the tail end of my individual item. And to me, that is less restful. It is substantially better, however, than this garbage, which is what you see a lot out there. We've got a get request that is adding users. You've got no purpose for the body anymore because you are decided you want to shove it all in your URL. Um, you get a 200 on errors, which bugs the crap out of me um, when you've got to parse the response body to determine an error. Um, all that kind of stuff. So if, if anything, just avoid these constructs. Um, also, it's just ugly. So. Okay, so I'm talking a lot about APIs, and there's also a, a, a common perspective of we'll build out an API when we have a client that needs an API, right? We'll, we'll internally, we, can, we have this nice vertical stack where I yank something from the database and shove it into a template, and I'm done, right? And you get things done really fast that way. But I really do believe that um, just making a web app is, is a fallacy at this point, in that you're going to have a mobile strategy, strategy at some point. You're going to have to go make it work on some random media streaming orb that Google released yesterday or the day before. You're going to have to um, have different interfaces. You're even going to be building out tools internally that you're, you're going to regret not having some external interface. Like, okay, well now I've got to like, copy my models over here or even worse things. So. I, and I think it's just looking forward. If you step back and say, what is it that my platform does? What am I providing to somebody? If all your, your, your ultimate thing that you're providing is HTML, okay, I'll, I'll buy that. And, and, and that's a done argument. But anything else, you might want to think about doing an API early. Because um, it's a lot harder to support existing infrastructure and copy all that behavior into a new API. Um, that, what I kind of said was a very or way of describing device agnostic, agnosticism. Um, again, you're going to design for any uh, consumer of your application, not just web browsers. Uh, and I, I tend to like think of it as one one more abstraction on MVC. Um, we have MVC inside of a web framework, but when you really think about it, your Python code is a controller, your database is your model, and so view is something maybe you have a view over here that's your HTML view, maybe you have a view over here that's your mobile app, that kind of thing. That's, that's how I tend to think about it and try to structure it. All right, so on to actually the, the Python thing about tonight. Um, Tornado is a, that's a library, and this, the library does several things. First off, the Python wrapper around the ePoll select. Is anybody, who's familiar with ePoll and select? Okay, so you guys generally know um, how that functions then. I'll cover asynchronous in a minute for those of you who don't uh, know what that is. But anyway, it wraps, it's a, it's a nice clean um, wrapper around that, uh, just an event loop. Um, it's on top of your event loop, you have this thing called IO stream and that just works with file descriptors or sockets or whatever and allows you to have a nice flexible asynchronous interface to that. Um, on top of that, you have an actual HTTP server, um, HTTP 1.1, all that. but uh, it is a full-on server, and on top of that, you have a minimalist web framework. So, I'm mostly going to be talking about that top stack, but it's important that you understand the whole structure. So, Django and Flask and those operate in a WSGI context, right? You, you hook them up to Apache or whatever, and, and your code is run behind those web servers. Tornado actually has its own whole web server. Now, you can actually run Tornado in WSGI mode. You lose all of your asynchronous goodness, but you you can run it that way if you just like 
the simplicity, the minimalism of Tornado and, and the way it abstracts components apart. Um, yeah. <laughs> 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 That's my, my hating on JavaScript. I like Node. I like Node. <laughs> <laughs> so on, in, um, in addition to all that, it has some things that I would argue might even not need to be in Tornado core, but it has a lot of cool things like um, like Twitter and Facebook auth built in, so it, you just give it your tokens and it'll do all the OAuth dance. Um, it's got testing helpers, which I'm definitely going to talk about, and lots of other just little things in there that, that help you build out cool things. Um, one more point about um, Tornado that I forgot to write up here, and, and several of the asynchronous frameworks are that one of the downsides of them of asynchronous frameworks are that you generally have to rewrite a lot of libraries to support whatever loop library they use at the core. Right? It's like Twisted had its, um, its reactor model and all the stuff built around that, and Tornado's got the IO loop, and Gevent actually is one that's an exception to that. It's just if you're cool with monkey patching, then uh, it just works. Uh, and uh, then there's a couple other ones, but that's one of the downsides is you could have this awesome Python library that you've been using, like requests, and you come over Tornado World, and guess what? You don't. You, you could use that, but it's blocking code in your asynchronous world. So, I'm gonna talk quickly about asynchronous. Um, you can go really deep on this, but it's just event driven. If if you haven't done that, I'm going to do some of that today. But it's a it's a pretty interesting um, process of writing code. It solves um, everything is handled in a single request, and your Call back, you register callbacks to occur on, on certain events. And so everything is, is just one process um, instead of a new, uh, new one for each request, like a lot of the servers in a generic sense do. Uh, it helps address certain problems while creating new ones. Um, if you've looked at a lot of node projects, or I've, I've written some very ugly uh, tornado code, um, you, you'll start getting like callback hell and spaghetti code, and, and it gets harder to debug if you don't separate things out pro properly. So in an asynchronous world, I argue even more for test driven because it's debugging that stuff in a live environment can get fun. Um, and yeah, we use it at UStudio um, Tornado in, in its asynchronous concept uh, context because it's great for uh, the, this sort of new generation of single page web apps that, that um, open a web socket or long polling connection and, and all your events go back and forth through there. Uh, it's but it's pretty easy to do. So um, I'm going to <laughs> do, um, my example was just a fun little game. Um, I, we could have done a blog or whatever, but blog API is not that fun. So um, I figure we're, I'm going to show you pieces of this, the, this little demo I put together. But um, this is just a little draw something. Well, it would have been a draw something called if I finished it out. Uh, so, all right, that's awesome. I can't see. I can't see my bar, so I can't get my URL. So I just broke the demo. Uh, this is not Linux's fault. <laughs> <laughs> This wouldn't have a node. Chrome always works. Canvas object, and we draw around on it. Notice that I'm not actually drawing live, I'm not drawing until it fires, but, uh, and it comes down here, you would enter Python, and if I actually finished working on the front end, it would go through. So that's that's the basic concept. Um, it's, I wanted to show it to you so that you can see the, the, the concepts we have here. We have very simple, we have a room, we have a user, we have a game, we have, and we have events. That's 
the core of this whole app. So, So first thing we're going to do in a REST implementation is, oh, I already defined those, yeah, room, users, game, um, that's much it, and events. So first thing is you don't get the nice uh, cool tools um, with, that you get with Django where, really big, You don't get all of the, um, you don't have like a Django admin make app and then you get all of your, your folders and, and structures like that. You've got to define it yourself, which is not, uh, I don't think that's a bad thing. I've already made out my virtual environment and all that. I'm going to copy my requirements to show you what's in there. These are my requirements. I've got um, mostly nose is the first thing that you're going to want. Um, if you haven't used nose test, it's a testing framework. Works really well with unit test. Ties in very well with Jenkins and with other things. So nose is going to be the first thing you want. Um, I've got Tornado. I'm using Redis for my models and, and some little helper things. Tornado Redis, this is what I was referencing a minute ago. When you start working with libraries, if you want them to work asynchronous, you've got to go get a tornado implementation of a Redis client as opposed to the generic one. Now, that is if you want to use it in an asynchronous context. You can actually use core Redis, and it's fast enough that you don't have to worry about the blocking code in your asynchronous request. You can just pull it down. But for the event stuff, I need that. So, um, so I'm going to make a test directory. I'm going, to, I'm going to start with a controller. And first thing we're going to do is, is a really um, simple controller. And it's just going to, I'll, I'll expose the basics of how you write a, a tornado request. So, So Tornado has a testing module within it. Um, and it's got several different test cases. The first one is the async HTTP test case. Now this is important because when you start testing, um, when you start testing your, your, your handlers, your URL handlers, you can either spin up a server or do all this other garbage. Um, that it's kind of hard. Well, Tornado does it for you. So, uh, You can use it. I have all this pre baked for later. So I'll just use that. Um, so the first thing we want to do is test that the index controller responds to um, queries. So the async HTTP test case, what you have to implement is a Git app. And that is you return an instance of the Tornado application that it's then going to wrap with the I.O. loop and spin up and do all this kind of fun stuff for you. So I'm going to, uh, this 20 application here, and the what you always pass into the application is a list, um, is a list of routes that um, you want it to respond to. So. In Django, you have your URLs.py, or however you end up building on top of that. Um, and in this in this framework, Tornado, you have to build out your own. Like, where do you want to store these? So Jeremy actually wrote a fun little at route decor class decorator that you can put around your request handlers. Um, I've seen other people build out routers um, and other things. It's really up to you how you want to implement it. At the end of the day, you need to pass um, regular expressions. To, uh, to the application route. So we're just going to say that. We're going to say index controller. And yeah, that's all we need. 
Okay, so yeah, so it's telling me index controller is not there. Can you guys see the? No, not much. Can you guys read that? Okay, my 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 that you see how that gray it doesn't block out the text there. Okay, so we're going to return the application. And now, inside my test index controller, I can just do self.fetch here. This is an abstraction that Torn the Tornado testing framework uses. And then I just do self cert equal 200 response code. Response code. So this is a minimal test that's going to fail. Um, can you put that font size? Yeah. Uh, not that much. Better. OK. And this is a good reason to fix your bash RC so it doesn't show the full path. Uh, so I'm going to use nose tests. I use a little um, module called red nose so I get three colors. Dash X. So, and then pass the test. So obviously it's, it's going to fail because index controller is not there. Now, this is where, again, when you're writing, when you're doing test driven, some people put their the objects they're testing right inside the test until the last possible minute, and then they move it out into another file. So we can do that here. I actually tend to prefer to to build out my libraries as I'm doing it. So I will actually do my import statement at the top and bring in that index controller. It's up to you. We'll do both ways here. So if we say um, from tornado.web import request handler. Now we're going to actually start getting into the meat of tornado stuff. So Tornado's request handlers are subclass them, right? It's not, uh, you can do that now with Django class-based views. Um, Tornado's always been like this. There's no function-based approach to it. So we'll call it index controller, request handler, and so that, so here I could go ahead and start implementing my Git. I could start doing all sorts of cool things, but a test-driven approach would say, all right, my test says there's no index controller. I'm going to fix that test first, right? I've now given it an index controller. Now I have a bad response code. So minimal, minimally, I need to fulfill that response code. And so I can say pass. And I know the tornado by default now is 200. So I'm done. App done. I'm going to shut it here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so this is obviously part of the test driven thing is, again, it, this is where things really start to change when you do test driven because you're used to having full context of what you need to implement in your handler at the time you're writing your handler. Whereas test driven, you're fulfilling small contracts, right? And it's very easy if, if you haven't well thought out and planned what you're going to build that you miss something. For example, authentication or um, 404s because something that came out of the database didn't actually exist and you just started operating on it. All of those things are things that you'll um, hopefully start um, adapting to as you do test driven. Uh, so here we have no other uh, assertion. So if, if I was just going to make it a regular um, HTML view, right? If I was just going to treat this like a standard uh, Django class graph or something like that, I could say uh, x.htm. And this is Tornado's built-in template language. So it has its own. You're not forced to use it. It just has a few abstractions for you. Um, and they use Microsoft uh, file extensions for their HTML files? <laughs> no, that's just me. <laughs> <laughs> you can use whatever you want. So here, will you, does that make you happier? OK. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there. So this can be anything. I use it for our feeds, our RSS feeds, right? I just put XML. I actually do like that it doesn't force an extension like some template languages um, because then them doesn't throw up on my syntax highlighting other things. But the, syn the syntax of this is actually very similar to Django uh, templates. I'm actually not going to get into the templating systems. This is an API talk, but I encourage you to look at it. One thing about it is it's raw Python. You can do whatever you want. You want to do your list comprehensions inside of your template and like nested dictionary creation, you can. You probably shouldn't, but you can. So um, that's actually one thing I like about it because I hate the fact that in, in Django templates, I can't, in, like, I, I can't perform a basic mathematic operation to determine how many rows my Twitter bootstrap 
um, template needs. So it's, I guess it's um, individual uh, preference. All right, so I'm not going to mess with the index controller anymore. That's, in fact, I'm going to return this back because index controller is not really doing anything on our app. So I'm going to move on to an actual resource. And that's, um, the, so this concept you remember in the game, we have a, a series of, uh, you create a room, right? So here, um, and actually might be easier if I just show you the existing one. So if you're watching, you type. <coughs> if you approve of that. All right, so here we're going to get into a little more involved test. Um, first off, if you haven't done font size, oh yeah, um, <laughs> if you if you haven't done you know J unit or, or whatever testing framework before, um, you've got setups and teardowns. Um, what those do is before every test is run, you have a setup if you need it that that initializes some things. Maybe it shows values in database. Uh, maybe it mocks out some things, whatever you need. And then you have your teardown. So in this instance, I'm storing values in Redis. I'm just using that as my um, database backend. And so at the end of it, I want to throw all those values away uh, so I don't pollute my, my uh, future tests. Um, now, in that is obviously Tornado doesn't have a built-in ORM. It's use whatever you want. So if you want to use SQL Alchemy, if you want to use Mongo, if you like PyMongo, if you want to use whatever you want, um, you can do that. You are going to have to build that out yourself. So once again, you see the application. You construct your routes. And then this is the, yeah, that's what I want. Um, <laughs> this is the um, keyword arguments to application. And those are available as settings to any request handler, um, which I will show you. So I have a property here that every request handler has this uh, self.application.settings, and it's just your quarks are dumped into this uh, dictionary. Uh, so that what that means is you have a persistent connection the entire time Tornado is running. You have one Redis connection for this instance, the Tornado. So everything is pulling from it, pushing to it. It's it's, it's both nice in that you don't have to worry about every request spinning up or worrying about connection pools or, or any of that kind of stuff, but you also have to be aware of how your database layer works or, or how whatever this external service works if, if, you, if all your requests end up waiting on this one implementation, uh, you need to fix that. Uh, so let's go back to the test. So the first thing my, my test hit here did was it did a post with a uh, JSON body asserted 201 for creating. Um, after I did that, then I actually wrote a test where I inspected the contents of it. I wanted to assert that it was um, that this content was here. Now, what you you might notice here is I don't have the the other tests, right? I'm I'm only asserting that what I get back from the controller is this representation of um, of what I sent it. Because when I started going into this rooms controller, I needed this models room. So I instead of just implementing it. Um, I started out my test models, test room model. And so here I have, um, I'm going to object for a second. So then I immediately started testing out this, this room model. And Font size. Oh, yeah. Uh, I think I get bigger every time. Uh, so, you know, I test the construction, I test a few methods on it, etc. And then I start every new method I add to it. Oops. Every new method I add, I add a new test. So this is the test-driven process, right? I've got this, um, I got this request handler. It needs some other things. So I go into another test for each one of those individual items. They need a new interface, and I only add save when something calls room instance dot save. Right? I'm not going to just start adding things to my model until it needs it. Does that, does that make sense? Um, as soon as I need to have a uh, a fetch on it, right? I'm doing a, a get operation on the on the rooms. That's when I start adding that out. Um, 
You'll also notice that at the top I have this mock object. That's because um, when I start testing interaction with other other models, like this user here, I I'm not going to import user and start testing the behavior of user if I can help it. Right? What I want to do is mock out what's needed for the user contract to be okay, um, and that allows me to. Where's my uh, there? So here, I'm not actually getting back an instance of my user when I fetch it at the end of it. At the end, I'm just asserting that my mock fulfilled its contract. Does that make sense? Does anybody have any questions so far? All right. So that, that process continues, right? Like I have my room resources, then I have my game resources, then I have my user resources. Um, I'm not going to go into all those controllers because they're all ultimately the same. I will bring up one other one, and that's when we start needing authentication. Uh, so again, here my setup gets a lot more involved, and this is actually full-on integration because I'm actually, since this is a handler, I'm creating a new room, I'm creating like an actual model that's saving the database. I'm creating a new user, I'm creating a new game, and I'm you know, setting all these up, adding them to each other in the hierarchy I've defined. And then the teardown, of course, I have to, right, this is really easy, but I have to go wipe all those values. So the next time um, I run my tests, my uh, assertions for number of entries that are returned and all that are, are wonky. Um, so here, it's, it's a lot more fleshed out than the other ones. The other ones were success case is pretty much all I was testing, right? I posted assert 201 assert my response body looks good, all right. I wasn't doing what happens if I pass in bad values. I wasn't doing what happens if there's a value in the database, or there, there isn't a value in the database, and that should 404 and authentication and all that. So this is, over time, this is what your, your tests are gonna start looking more like. Um, so here we test with an invalid room ID, and it's a 404. Here's one with, um, <coughs> where I'm not providing any authentication. I need a key and a token is what I've defined for this API. Um, down here, I have a invalid key and token, right? So you start seeing that every single one of these um, possibilities of hitting the, the outside request are being tested. And what that means is later on, when I decide I have written this stupid authentication, pull the token from my arguments and test it 100 times, I'm gonna make a nice decorator or something that, that wraps around my git method I can do that totally internally, don't have to change any of my tests. I refactor that entire bit of code, run the tests, and I feel confident that, that all that worked. And we do that. We actually, that, that's one of the real liberating things when you have a, a code base that's got high 90s, 100% coverage, is you don't worry about, you feel this, this, this pain, right? This, there's this code smell in a certain area of the project that's, that needs to be refactored, and you see it touches a bunch of things. And you don't, you don't worry about going in and making the, the fixes when you can um, to improve it. You reduce code rot and all that kind of stuff when you have the flexibility that the tests provide. So um, so you actually get to see some of Tornado and not just what it serves look like. I will show you that uh, controller. All right, so actually I don't think I talked about how to implement even a Git. All right, so here's a, here's a full on request handler. Um, this is something I've added, it's not something you have to have. These are all like little helpful things. Uh, this Git credentials is one of those things I just talked about moving, moving things out. To implement a Git request in Tornado, you just put a Git method on your uh, request handler in, uh, class. And it takes whatever arguments you put in that regex, right? So you start doing groups, group matching, those will turn into, our, and they will explode arguments in your in your method. So in the particular regex that's driving this one, it matches, it looks for a room ID and a game UID. Um, and then here you can see I'm actually running. This is very similar for people who've, who've written Django. If you need to throw an error, you actually just raise an exception and it passes all the way through. Um, same thing here. And here you see I'm using 401s for, there is no, authentication parameters. Here I'm using 403 as forbidden when they provide authentication parameters that are invalid or <coughs> don't have access to that I. Um, yeah. And all of this is 
at some point in, in our current uh, stack at U Studio, we abstract all of this out into into new systems that we write because we saw we saw that there's a lot of cruft, a lot of bullets fired in the database, if not none, or if none, raise 404, all that kind of stuff. So we built out some uh, cool access control decorators that, that we put around things. We did all that after we had a big, not to harp on that point too much, but after we had a bunch of controllers that were written with a bunch of repeated code, we didn't have any problem pulling all that out and implementing some cool, um, some cool systems on top of it. So that is a plain flat request handler. We haven't talked about asynchronous at all yet. Um, and that's important when you start diving into Tornado. This is all, everything in this get method is blocking. We don't yield any, you don't have to see any cool yield constructs or anything like that. We just do things. Now, Redis is very fast. So I don't worry about fetching something on a key from Redis. I'm not going to start trying to do that asynchronously because actually there is a, a the, the Tornado Redis module that I'm using for other things is slower at doing these operations than the built-in, I mean, than the default Redis library because the default le Redis library uses the C extension and a lot of the, the Tornado-based ones use the Python only and so they're actually slower. So, all that to say, if your queries are fast, you don't have to worry about going over the top making everything asynchronous. If you're doing 40 queries in the body of one request handler, you're going to want to start breaking that up. Um, and there's ways to do that. But otherwise, we're blocking, we're writing, um, and Tornado has this implicit close out the request if it's a, a standard git post whatever method um, and return whatever status code you've set in it 200 by default. So let's start talking about what an asynchronous test looks like. Um, and that's, if you remember in the, the little thing I showed, when I, every time I drew a line, it sent off an event to the event system. Um, and that's just, I've, I've got a, a event contract there. And on the other side, obviously the other browser was listening to that. I'm using long polling here. You could be using web sockets. You could be using one of the abstractions like uh, there's a Tornado socket IO implementation, so you can use the JavaScript socket IO in your web browser and um, you conform to the socket.io um, interface on the other side. There's SockJS, which I actually prefer. It's a little more like raw web sockets. It, it looks and feels like the web socket, web socket implementation in the browser um, as opposed to socket.io has some really cool stuff on top of it, but it, uh, you're, you're learning a new interface at that point. It's not the web socket. Um, so let's see. Just All right, now this thing gets a little hairy. So I build out my app. Uh, at this point, I have I have actually abstracted my app because I needed other requirements. So I'm, I'm not using Tornado.web application anymore. I've subclassed and I'm using it somewhere else. I've got this dispatcher, which I can go into later. It's it's a it's a thing that talks to the Tornado Redis um, for me. Um, I'm using PubSub on it, so I, I've i attached to my application, it's now available in my request handler. My test looks, this is where it gets kind of fun, you're going to see this, this thing called the I.O. loop. That's what I talked about earlier, the I.O. loop is what wraps ePoll um, or Select or whatever, KQ I think um, in Mac, and it, here we have to start working with it when we're trying to fire off things in an asynchronous world because as soon as I called that fetch earlier, this blocks within the body of my test because what it's doing is it's taking that application I return and get out. It's putting it on the IO loop. It's saying go, it, it's attaching all those events that it needs to and saying, uh, you know, respond appropriately to incoming requests, etc. And then it's starting the IO loop. And the actual act of, of starting the IO loop blocks whatever current process or thread you're in. Um, so here, if we're trying to open up a request, wait a little while, and then fire an event that comes back down, we have to use the IO loop to, to say, sometime in the future, do this thing. And it will, when, when it goes through the loop at some point, it will, it will fire that callback. And that's what this is saying. I'm saying, in about half a second from now, I want you to use the dispatcher and fire an event. So now, this will block, and if I don't do this, uh, if I were to, to comment this out, Tornado's testing framework would sit there on that fetch, 
and it would wait five seconds and then raise a async timeout error. Now that's a pretty thing that the tornado, does, the tornado testing framework does for you. It doesn't, if you use self.fetch, it assumes you don't want to um, be waiting on that forever. But if you write your, if you weren't using testing and, and seeing that you have these things that where events were firing, you could actually have clients on the other side open up a, a request and sit there forever because something in your code is wrong. So anyway, what you're doing here, again, is, is throwing that, that um, event firing later on. We, when that event fires, it should come back to us. And at that point, I'm testing that my event body looks the same. And here I'm just doing more things. I'm firing, firing events that don't match whatever the regex is I'm looking for, etc. I'll show you the last thing I'll show you in this. So once you start actually implementing an asynchronous request handler, you use this very well worded, oh, very well named asynchronous decorator. What that says is get method, like I mentioned before, is a blocking uh, call by default. It will, it will block at the end of the operation, it will close out the request and send down uh, anything that's in the buffer. What at asynchronous tells it is don't do that. When get returns, just carry on fulfilling other callbacks, and at some point in time, something will call me, and I will finish the request. Now, this is how you can have a um, a request hang forever. Because if I didn't do this right, if I didn't say, "Hey, uh, when something happens, call this other method," now my request hangs open until your browser decides to close it, or your iPhone client decides to that it's done waiting on it and times out. Um, here is our response. So what is passed into these arguments depends on what you're, you're implementing. Um, the tornado HTTP, async HTTP client just passes your response object where you can see if you were to hit Google, for example, wait on that and then get a fire, you get your callback fired, you can look into that response. What I've implemented on the dispatcher actually gives me the event channel and it gives me the, the, that body of the message that I fired. Um, anyway, and then I, this is the important point of an asynchronous handler. You have to call finish if you want it to ever get down to the other end. Uh, so that's an asynchronous thing. Now you notice post here, normal blocking operation. I accept an event, put it in Redis, and I'm done. I don't need to do anything asynchronous there. So that is asynchronous in Tornado World. It's actually pretty simple. It's when you start mixing, all right, call Twitter and wait on that, or we get a response from that, okay, store it in the database and wait for an event, okay, um, wait on that. When you start having six or seven events um, kicking off each other, that's when debugging gets fun, and again, I just argue more strongly for tests. So at the end of this, I had 100% coverage. Uh, you can. If I run everything with coverage and everything, uh, you see here, during lines of code, whatever. And I can do a lines of code count on tests. I know I have a lot more lines of code in my tests, but I feel more confident pre-factoring that. Um, let me see if there's anything else somewhere. Oh, I killed Chrome. Um, so the last thing is now we have all these awesome tests, but you don't actually have anything you can run on your on your uh, server. So that's a <coughs> that I actually kind of leave up to <coughs> individual's discretion on whether you want to test drive that out or not. Right? This is just a a script we're going to fire up to actually start the server. <coughs> I assume you have all of these interfaces tested somewhere, right? I assume you're not putting in your, your start the server um, something 
that isn't tested, right? So if you start pulling from environment variables because you're deploying to Heroku, if you're test driving that, you should build out a config module that does that, that you test that behavior, and then you just you you pass it in, pass through on your on your um, starting with the server, those kind of things. So I have full tests for my dispatcher. I have full tests for my Terminator application. You could still argue that this whole thing needs to be tested. That gets more fun because then you, if you actually want to test that I can run Python serve.py, you might want to spin up a sub process and you get outside of the tornado testing. But other than this, this serve.py, I say test everything. This is up to you. Anyway, the, this is all you have to do to start an application. Though you get, you have that that application that you've constructed. You pass in routes to it. Um, I actually pass in routes inside my subclass now, so I don't have to. This this application here is. Again, not the Tornado web application, it's my own. Um, so that's why you don't see those there. I pass in my settings, and then I um, give the support. And then it's very important that you start the IO loop, because since this is an asynchronous framework, I've said application, or IO loop here, take the application and attach all the event handlers, but the loop is not running until I do this, right here. And then it blocks, and it will serve. Um, it, as a side note, if you've been if you've done much node programming um, or anything like that, some of the some of the asynchronous frameworks, well, some of the servers just in general, when they hit an exception, they will kill the server. Tornado is not like that. It it automatically turns that into a 500, um, logs the issue and just carries on. So that is a niceness of Tornado. That's also you need to make sure you have the right logging hooks because you can have a bunch of 500s and not know if you're not getting those uh, emailed to you. But, um, yeah, that's about it. So, <coughs> do we have any questions? Yeah. Does, does uh, Tornado have a nice, uh, anything like 